<clears throat> Is my dog barking, dog's barking being picked up? <laughs> Okay, so I think we can get started, Mr. Paula. Let me start. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for uh, this Trinity Town Hall entitled, How Do We Move Forward from the Effects of COVID-19 as a Global Community? Today, our moderator is Rachel uh, Puvathor, a, a student of class of, of 2022 an international studies major with a focus in global health, vice president of the student group International Crisis Initiative, a Trinitarian reporter, and most recently winner of the Kindness Award. Rachel. Thank you, Dr. Nishikawa, um, for that nice introduction. I'm happy to be the moderator for today's panel. Um, we have very distinguished faculty um, among our panel, as our panelists for today. So I'm just going to introduce them. Um, first, we have Dr. John Doherty. He is a visiting professor of biology at Trinity University with a PhD in molecular virology and microbiology from Baylor College of Medicine. Um, we also have Dr. David McPherson. He is the chair of our economics department here at Trinity. He is also the E.M. Stevens professor of economics. We also have Dr. Alfred Montoya. He is the professor. He's a professor of sociology and anthropology, East Asian studies, and is co-chair of the international studies department. We also have Dr. Ji Zhang, who is a professor of modern languages and literatures, and she is specializing in Chinese literature and film. So thank you all. Thank you all for joining us, wherever you are joining us from, the live stream or Zoom. Um, and thank you to our panelists who are joining us today too. Um, I wanted to open up with a quick, a short uh, check-in with our panelists. I know this transition to online learning and working from home is, you know, it poses challenges and maybe some benefits in some cases. Um, so I wanted to check in with our panelists. How has your um, transition to online learning and working from home been? Um, I guess we can start with Dr. Doherty. Sure, happy to start. Um... It's been a really interesting transition. Um, labs have been really difficult to transition to kind of an online environment because we're so used to hands-on learning and having students go through the scientific process themselves. And so I know several faculty, myself included, have gone to kind of mock labs where you write protocols and we generate results based on things like, so that's been interesting, not so much fun. Lecture has been fun because not only for myself, but many students have various animals joining um, tuition free and getting an education in virology or whatever other class they might be joining. And my dog is behind me, but being shy right now. So he might make an appearance later, but we'll see. Nice. Thank you, Dr. Doherty. Um, Dr. McPherson, how is your training? Uh, uh, I've never spent this much time at home since I was in high school. Um, my dog is really happy with a golden retriever. I don't think he's gotten this amount of attention <laughs> um, since he was a uh, member of our family. But other than that, doing pretty well. Nice. Um, Dr. Montoya? Uh, I've had a, a very uh, painless time transitioning to the online uh, system, but I think that mostly has to do with the flexibility and resilience of, of our students rather than anything uh, that I've done from this side. Uh, and so I, I do know, you know, that uh, students have different circumstances and some students are having a, mu uh, a much more difficult time uh, having this transition. So I hope if uh, unfortunately we have to continue uh, this way into the fall that uh, some of those, um, there can be some resources for those students who are, are finding it much more challenging uh, to end classes or have the technology uh, serve the kinds of learning that we're now being forced to, to undertake. My shout out is, is actually to my students, <laughs> to, to whatever we're doing here um, back home. Nice. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Zhang, how has your transition been? 
different semester for me um, as I am on sabbatical. Um, so I don't teach courses, um, but um, so I feel a little anxiety um, about being left behind with Zoom technology. <laughs> and last week I advised my students for fall pre-registration and I've been asking them each to send me a Zoom link. <laughs> And uh, I've been collaborating with uh, other you know, scholars and we have used the Zoom regularly as well. And so far it has been very smooth. And another part of the experience is to be my kids teaching assistant. And uh, all of them, all three of them, uh, you know, doing online learning. And it's interesting to you know, um, see the uh, curriculum from K to 12 um, so closely because I'm responsible for uploading them <laughs> afterwards. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel that I've been updated with technology a lot recently. Right, I mean, we're lucky to have technology that allows us to still get this education and connect with students and other faculty, but it definitely poses challenges. But also we get to spend time with our furry friends like Dr. McPherson and Dr. Doherty were saying. Um, so I guess we're gonna go into our topic. Um, we are again, asking the question, how do we move forward from the effects of COVID-19? Um, so our first question for discussion is, um, in this new normal, people may see many countries closing their borders, as well as um, they might perceive this as countries isolating themselves instead of connecting. That being said, this pandemic has actually called for cooperation at many levels, um, from the prevention of the virus to, this, um, to the treatment of the disease. Do you have any thoughts? I'm gonna open this up to any of our panelists um, who want to speak on it. Should I tell one of the panelists? <laughs> yes, you go on, so. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Doherty, do you have- I, say, I, I don't wanna talk in, over anyone, but I can at least get us started, I guess. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll take the first step. <laughs> and maybe not land on my face. Um, as far as closing borders, you know, in contrast to needing open communication, I think having safe, open communication and sharing of data is gonna be essential moving forward, not only within the US, state by state, you know, the state level and federal level, but internationally is understanding what we are experiencing, how that differs from what other countries are experiencing, and how, if this virus is changing, how disease is manifesting, because we're starting to see manifestations that we wouldn't have expected. And so open communication, sharing resources if safe, safely if possible, I think is really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, but I also understand the impulse or the instinct to kind of keep to ourselves and uh, try and protect ourselves with closing borders and things like that. But from an infection spread standpoint, once the disease is already in the country, it's not necessarily gonna be super beneficial to shut everything down um, at the cost of those beneficial interactions would be my thought. And everyone else feel free to add. <laughs> well, I, I think that that, yeah, it's a great uh, sort of comment. Thank you, Dr. Doherty, uh, for starting us off. Um, I think it's, it's obvious now to everybody that, um, you know, in, in, the, in the future, the next you know, foreseeable future, these kinds of pandemics or, or localized epidemics uh, will become a global. And I, I don't think that anyone believes that, um, you know, the coronavirus uh, is checking people's passports or, or worried about, uh, you know, points around borders. Uh, and I think um, taking a more uh, planetary uh, vision in terms of disease control and, and having open exchange, like Dr. Doherty mentioned, data uh, and epidemiological information um, is going to be not only important, but necessary for us uh, in for the next foreseeable future, as these kinds of events become more frequent and, and uh, spread faster than we have imagined, right? So our Current system is a kind of patchwork of, of national systems that are co gently coordinated. Um, but I think um, throughout this coming century, um, that system that served us okay in the 20th century will probably prove to be inadequate for the kinds of challenges that we're um, are going to face. Okay. Dr. McPherson or Dr. Jane? 
Yes, um, 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 I like to follow up because I really like your point about the virus doesn't have a nationality. And I myself crossed the border um, in January uh, when I traveled to China briefly. And uh, so from January until now for three months, I've been experiencing this uh, virus uh, wherever I live. And uh, um, I feel that, um, you know, the, the um, um, development of technology in testing and in uh, treatment and in vaccine all depend on international collaboration. And I also feel that uh, in the long term, um, and it's um, more urgent than ever, is um, there are also other um, causes uh, that need international collaboration, such as um, poverty um, and such as um, education, how to make education accessible um, uh, as, you know, um, widely as a equalizer uh, for society. Um, and also poverty uh, leads to poor health and uh, poor health leads back to poverty. So how to break this vicious cycle? Um, it requires a lot of international uh, collaboration and closing the border won't help with that. Okay, Dr. McPherson, did you wanna add anything? Well, I disagree with, agree with the idea that sharing of information uh, about tr potential treatments or uh, development of a vaccine, that's a lot more uh, efficient if they do it over a global um, basis rather than trying to have each country trying to do it separately without input from other countries. And understand that they got the genetic code very fast uh, this time for the virus by all this cooperation. And if we're going to reduce the damage from this virus, more of that cooperation would be better. Okay. Um, I want to just elaborate on Dr. Zhang's point, I think, about these social determinants of health, such as like poverty and education level. Dr. Montoya is smiling because this is something we talk about in global health. Um, but I think, I mean, I, I mean, can I just open it up to that? What do you think are, um, the implications for these um, other determinants of health in a COVID, in a post COVID-19 world, um, such as what are the implications um, for people living in poverty, people who don't have access to resources and, you know, that might mean they don't have as much access to testing as they, as other people, um, these inequalities arise. And we're going to get into this later too, but I just wanted to throw that out there since Dr. Jane brought it up. I could take a first stab, and, and I would love if Dr. Doherty uh, could jump in uh, and add some of his expertise uh, in terms of the biology of the virus. As my global health class, uh, and, and basically all of my classes are sick of hearing over and over, uh, disease is uh, profoundly social. Uh, and the way that uh, disease spreads has as much to do with its biology as its, its sociology, for instance, better term. Um, and I think we're seeing that uh, increasingly here in the United States, but also as this virus and, and cases um, are spreading to those population dense parts of the world, like for instance, in South Asia, um, where people are living very, very close together, where people have to go out to work every day in order to have income coming from the household, and that the sociology of those places, the way that human agglomerations uh, and settlement has occurred um, will pose much more significant challenges than, for instance, in a place like San Antonio, where we're, where we're all basically spread out uh, over a, a larger geographic area. So I think, um, you know, I, I think it's becoming quite obvious uh, to everyone that how we understand uh, structural forms of inequality uh, will help as much as the biology of the virus to anticipate what will happen um, in terms of progress of the virus through human communities. And also, I would like to add before. I, I stopped talking, <laughs> uh, that um, those pockets of disadvantage that we have allowed to fester, allowed to, um, to be thrown back upon their own resources also pose in our global world um, and in the world of epidemics, challenges for us in the future. The longer that these areas, these uh, marginalized populations uh, are, are left to their devices or upon, to fall upon their own resources, that poses a threat for all of us going forward, even the most secure and the wealthiest and so on. Because again, the, the virus doesn't uh, doesn't care about our 
our amazing plans, right? Or uh, our credit score, um, but it does follow its its sort of throughout um, human human freedom. Right, Dr. Doherty, can you provide maybe a biological um, virology perspective to this? Uh, sure. I mean, a lot of the highlights of what Dr. Montoya was just talking about, as far as you know, our main response in the states have been advocating for social distancing. Um, and a lot of us you know, capable of working from home, many people are, probably, are absolutely not able to do that. Um, and that's a whole other series of issues to get into, but um, looking at socioeconomic status, social status, what is the norm? Um, most people in the world probably don't live in an area where they can stand six feet away from everyone else in their homes based on having children come home, having families, having um, other relatives living in same areas, uh, people clustered together in small living areas. And so I would think it's interesting to think of a virus as an equalizer in the fact that it can, can and potentially could infect everyone who's exposed to it, but it also serves to really, really, really highlight the inequalities like Dr. Montoya was talking about that are inherent in not only our society, but globally. Um, you know, talking about socioeconomically, um, people living in clustered conditions, typically having lower access to healthcare, lower access to proper nutrition, higher incidences of comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, all of which are leading to a more likely negative outcome in the presence of COVID-19. Um, that's why we're seeing health disparities even in the states where um, there's significantly more um, death and disability from uh, this disease in certain populations that have higher prevalences of these comorbidities. And that's equalizer in the sense that it can infect everyone, but it is pointing a big finger at all of these social inequalities that we're oftentimes leading to their own devices, as Dr. Montoya mentioned. Right. So it's not helping the spread and as far as social distancing, things like that. Okay. All right, well, we're gonna go to our second question. Thank you for your insight. Um, to all our panelists. Um, my second, our second question for discussion is, many of us saw how the pandemic affected the local econ economy. What about the world's economy? The global supply chain was fractured, the demand was weakened, flights are stopped. Um, is there a remedy from an economist, economist perspective or any other perspectives? Um, I guess we'll start with Dr. McPherson if we still have him on the line. Yes, I'm here. Uh, I have a, a video went away. Sorry, just a second. Oops, Oop, sorry, something happened there. Uh, I, I would say one of the, the bad effects that we're doing is um, having these trade barriers. Um, Trump has these uh, tariffs against t China that, and they're a major supplier of uh, personal protection equipment. And some of it's at seven and a half percent, some of it's at 25. And so when we're bidding against other countries for personal protection equipment, we're having to pay an inflated price and other countries can under, you know, outbid us. Um, so I would get rid of the, economists hate trade barriers, period. So uh, I, it's particularly important to get rid of them now. Um, and these trade barriers would slow the economic recovery, not just for us, but the entire world. Um, so I, I would get rid of that for sure. Um, and other things you want to do is keep the supply chain going in the U.S. Uh, as well as the rest of the world. France and uh, Denmark, and to a lesser extent us, have tried to have firms keep workers employed. By this payroll protection uh, program pays employers, gives them a loan, but what happens is the loan is forgiven if they keep the workers employed uh, currently for two months. Um, that I, I think is a good strategy to try and uh, keep workers tied to firms, keep standard living up for um, workers so that when the economy does get restarted again, it's go the workers are already attached to the firm, they don't lose human capital. Um, we're also doing bad policy too. Um, Paying workers, what they've done is they encourage firms to fire lower wage workers by giving a $600 bonus 
on top of their normal unemployment benefit. And so workers are better off being fired than staying with the firm. So I, I would have expanded the payroll protection program and eliminate the, uh, this bonus for unemployment, right? Just don't fire the workers in the first place. Um, I think that's a bad strategy. That's one of the reasons the unemployment rate has risen so fast is that in fact, firms are encouraged to fire people. And that, that's not a good idea. Um, another thing they could do is obviously expand testing and provide uh, personal protection equipment for workers as well as customers, right? The economy is not going to get revived until feel, people feel safe. No matter if, even if the president says, go out and we're going to restart the economy today, that's not going to work unless people feel safe to do so, right? Right. So. Well, I have a follow-up question on the payroll protection program. Um, does this payroll protection require that workers under the protection have to go to work or are they, it, no? No, they just have to not fire them. <laughs> just got to keep paying them. I mean, in France and Denmark have really done that and we've done a bit of it. It's restricted the small businesses. Um, now it's not done well because the implementation has been problematic to say the least, but the idea is a good one. Um, it, it's better than encouraging firms to fire because the problem with firing all the workers is that when the firms have to go rehire the workers, they might go to some other firm, right? They, they might lose the human capital that's built in with those workers. So um, I know it sounds good to go give higher unemployment benefits, but it'd be better not to fire them in the first place. Mm -hmm. Because correct, be the, correct me if I'm wrong, any of the panelists, but when if workers are fired, um, there is a period, at least whether short or long, where they don't have health insurance anymore. Am I right? Yeah, yeah you're not going to have health insurance. If you have a thing called COBRA, which you can get for 18 months, but you have to pay the cost for that. Again, it'd be better not to fire the workers. They could have the health insurance. Um, so it's a mixture of what I think are good policies and bad policies. When you want to develop policy so quickly, inevitably you're going to make some mistakes. But um, I, I just don't think it's a real good idea. Imagine if you're making uh, $10 an hour and typically unemployment benefits pay you about half. So you'd get about $5 an hour, but then they're going to give you an extra $15 an hour in unemployment benefits on top of your five. So you get $20 an hour. Mm -hmm. So the workers will want to get fired, right? Because you're going to be better off financially. And firms, there's been a lot of you know, uh, anecdotal evidence of firms saying that's what they're doing is because the, it's beneficial for the workers to get fired. Right. Okay. Um, do any of the other panelists want to touch on this? I know Dr. McPherson is our expert economist, but Maybe there's another perspective that might inform this. Okay. Um, we can definitely go back to the economist perspective, I think in our Q&A, because I'm sure like myself, I'm not familiar with the economics of a pandemic. So I'm sure other people have questions about it as well. Um, we'll move on to our next question then. Um, what do we know now about the virus that will for sure change how we live our lives. Um, I think another way to frame this question is what will the new normal look like? Maybe we can take like a six months out perspective, what will it look like from a year from now? I know we're asking you to predict things. But <laughs> I, I would imagine that it actually relates pretty well to the economic question in the sense of the new normal is going to require certain conditions that make people feel safe to go out, participate in the economy, go back to work, go to restaurants, work in a restaurant, doing all the things that we have put a hold on. And in order to get to that new normal, um, there's a couple of things that are going to be required and depends on when those things are available and when they're widespread and accessible to everyone, regardless of 
socioeconomic status or as, as accessible as they can be. And some of those are widespread testing. Um, there are antibody tests that are being worked on. They are not FDA approved as far as I know as of yet um, that can be used to say, oh, someone is, has been infected in the past. And if we can exp uh, test ideally everyone in the country and say, okay, these people have been um, infected in the past, they have developed immunity, we presume, we don't know, but we presume they would be protected, those persons may be more comfortable getting out into the workforce, participating in the economy, participating in society, as opposed to someone who has not been protected or previously infected. Going along with that, of course, as everyone is familiar with the idea with a safe, effective vaccine, which despite sound bites saying it will be ready soon is at least a year out, something like that. Uh, these things take time and that's a year out sounds like a long time. That's very, very, very fast for mm -hmm. development and testing of a vaccine. Um, so putting those together, I think would help people feel safe as Dr. McPherson said, to get out and contribute and get back to the new normal. But um, I think the idea of everyone just saying, okay, we're done and we're stop social distancing, stop all of those things would uh, be a significant detriment to the progress that we've made in controlling this infection. Right. So this hinges on um, this like immunity. Um, I don't know if it's a theory or if it's been proven. Can you speak on this more? Because I've read um, some articles saying that the immunity that one might confer after like being infected with COVID and then recovering, it's not necessarily been proven. What it, can you speak on the scientific progress in terms of that, Dr. Um, well, we just don't know yet as far as, we do know that people make antibodies in response to an infection. I mean, that's, that's pretty common. Um, and the question is, do those antibodies confer protection or immunity? Um, and that's not been studied well yet. It's, it's work in progress. Um, and the concern is that we might say, oh, you have antibodies, but they're not necessarily protective. So you are not immune. We also don't know how long those antibodies, if they are protective, would persist in a human. I just, you're familiar about vaccines where you have to get boosters. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes you get one vaccine as a child now, it confers long-term, lifelong protection. Sometimes you have to get a booster every year, or um, not every year, every so often, or you have to do a series of three vaccines to get immunity. And we just don't know at this point in time um, what is conferred by natural infection versus immunization. Um, so that's, that's work that has to be figured out. Right. And I, if I could just add uh, to what Dr. Jordi is mentioning, what, what he is discussing is the, the possibility or the reinfection rate from, from this virus after one has, has recovered or one has been asymptomatic. And, um, and nobody knows that at this point, as far as, as I'm aware. Um, there's some preliminary data I read last week from Hokkaido. Hokkaido in Japan, the prefecture in Japan, had a very um, early uh, and deep a social distancing campaign where they shut everything down. And as they um, sort of leveled off their, the upswing of, of cases and it looked like uh, they were through the worst of it, they began to release uh, some of those lockdown um, requirements and they experienced very quickly an upsurge in, uh, in cases. And so I think, um, you know, it might feel like a long time for us, you know, for the, you know, the last month uh, in lockdown and so on, but we, we, it hasn't actually been that long in terms of the duration uh, the time that it takes in order to establish these kinds of parameters for for a particular virus, or to generate a vaccine, or to understand uh, the capacity of this particular pathogen uh, to mutate, for instance. So, a strain that I encountered uh, in March can be very, very different from a strain that I come up, you know, encounter uh, sometime in the summer. Uh, and so, these kinds of things. Um, make the, the job of prediction. Anthropologists are not uh, great at prediction to begin with, and my crystal ball is in the shop. Uh, but these kinds of factors, I would remind uh, our, our viewers, uh, these sort of biological factors coupled together with the social things that we are doing are putting in place, our policies, our missteps, um, the kinds of inequalities that we are, we've discussed it in the past half hour, those things will determine what the future looks like, what the quote unquote, new normal uh, might be. And I think it, it also bears mentioning um, 
you know, was it normal before to have large numbers of people out of healthcare coverage? Or was it normal uh, to pack uh, millions of people around the world uh, in, into slums and so on? Uh, I, don't, I don't think so. And, and I think um, it might behoove us to rethink some of those things that we consider to be normal. Um, and for all of its uh, sort of massive downsides economically and socially and in terms of morbidity and mortality, it might also be an opportunity for us to re-examine some of the things we took for granted. Um, how our, our economy is structured, for instance. I think large numbers of, of our workers uh, work in hourly wage, you know, hourly wage jobs at the very sort of bare minimum of, of subsistence uh, on in order to produce a more resilient set of uh, systems uh, so that when we face the ne next epidemic, um, we will be not as much in, as on our, on our back foot as, as we are uh, currently. Um, but I also would, would like to emphasize uh, a point that Dr. Darty mentioned, which is uh, we are way behind on testing uh, and our surveillance capacity in terms of this virus. Texas, I think I read this morning, it's 45th out of the states in terms of its testing capacity, right? So without testing and disease surveillance and case tracing um, ability, establishing things like reinfection rate uh, and so on are virtually impossible. So having an emphasis or putting some resources behind sort of the basic public health <coughs> strategies that we've been familiar with for 150 years might be in, you know. Okay. Did any of our other panelists want to jump in on that conversation for that question? Okay, um, so we will actually move on to our last question. And we brought this up earlier and it's kind of been weaved throughout this whole discussion um, about COVID-19 being called by many sources, um, quote, un quote unquote, the great equalizer. Um, why do you think people propagate this equal effect narrative? Is it accurate to what extent um, or is it completely inaccurate? Um, and we we kind of touched on this before, but I'm sure we've had new people join the live stream or our Zoom conversation. So um, yeah, I'm gonna open that up to our panelists. Um, maybe we can talk to Dr. Zhang. We haven't heard from you in a minute. Start. Um. Yeah, every day I feel that I'm very priv privileged to have a home to practice the stay at home order. And uh, I also feel that we have clean water and we have soap to wash your hands up to 10 times, 20 times a day. And, um, you know, um, we can work from home. That means we have internet and we have the devices. Um, I know that some kids in my son's schools do not have um, the devices for them to um, get the access to the homework. Um, and uh, so all these things, um, I feel that uh, recognizing that I'm a very pri privileged part of the society, um, I, um, we have to uh, recognize that uh, there are also others who are kind of uh, proportionally um, affected by this uh, disease. Um, I was um, listening to the um, local radio the other day, it talked about um, you know, um, the uh, African-American community really suffered a lot um, in San Antonio and uh, uh, the um, rate, um, uh, the death rate is higher um, than the other. Um, and I also, um, you know, in person experienced um, this kind of social and political uh, impact um, with COVID-19 um, being um, labeled as the Chinese virus. And uh, um, I've had friends who um, would rather not to wear a mask to go to the grocery store um, in order to avoid um, some kind of potential hate crime um, and uh, would rather to expose, be exposed or to have the risk of actually um, uh, having the virus. And so uh, in some way, um, I, uh, I feel that, uh, for instance, the Asian American community is very devastated because they have been experiencing this since January. And, uh, um, and then they're re-experiencing this again. And uh, um, according to a recent uh, survey, um, there are more than 100 cases of hate crimes against uh, Asian America um, in this country. And uh, going to the grocery store, going to the park uh, and walking in the neighborhood can be a very risky thing um, for a lot of people. And we re really need a lot of support. 
Yeah. We are seeing this like increase, I guess, in, in racism and um, maybe like the rhetoric, the general rhetoric has been um, validating of this in negative ways. Um, yeah, I'm, it just makes me so sad to hear that. Um, it's not accurate at all. Other panelists, would you like to talk about this equal effect narrative and maybe the detriments to society it's having? Um, and maybe to what extent is um, correct? Is, is the equal effect correct? Well, I get, there's been some recent research that came out last couple of weeks looking at what fraction of workers can work at home. Mm -hmm. And it's about a third. So for one third of the workers, you can protect yourself a lot from catching, you know, uh, COVID. But two thirds of the workers, it's a lot tougher, right? Particularly people who are uh, working in grocery stores or uh, meat packing plants, right? That one in South Dakota has got hundreds of people uh, affect that. I mean, the, the virus doesn't have any uh, state borders or, or uh, check your income level, but there is differences in how you can protect yourself. Some people can protect themselves pretty well, others not so much. Like one of the safest occupations um, is being a dentist, I mean, sorry, uh, is being an attorney. Uh, and one of the worst obviously is a dentist because you're so close to other people. Um, I'm actually doing some research right now looking at the effects of COVID on terms of wages, employment, and seeing what sectors have been most affected. And one of the factors I'm including is uh, your exposure to um, every occupation's rate on exposure to diseases as well as proximity to others. And dentists do really poorly on that, as do acute care nurses. Um, but attorneys, you know, they can work from home. I bet your college professors are probably pretty good on that scale too. Yeah. I'd like to, you know, just to reiterate something that, that my colleagues have mentioned at the at the top of the hour, uh, which is that, um, you know, that epidemics it sort of in general reveal uh, not only our prejudices, uh, but also the deficiencies in our existing systems, our infrastructure, and so on. And so we're seeing, uh, and it's it's. Unfortunately, not super surprising for those people who, who track uh, sort of the social determinants of health and, and disease distribution and so on, that people of color uh, and people who are living in poverty are much more likely to, um, to catch uh, coronavirus and much more likely to die from coronavirus once they have. Uh, and this is because people of color and the impoverished are less likely to be insured. Uh, they're more likely to live on fixed incomes. Um, they're more likely to have pre-existing conditions, as Dr. Gordy mentioned uh, some time ago. They are also more likely to work in jobs that require them to go out of the home. Mentioning, there was a story in the New York Times from last week that said uh, in Louisiana uh, and in Chicago, um, African Americans make up something like seventy percent of the people who have died from uh, coronavirus uh, in the past several months, and so even though uh, the virus itself only cares about one thing, which is attacking human uh, respiratory systems, the way that we have structured the terrain in which this virus has encountered human respiratory systems has produced this sort of unfortunate um, between, between us who can be here in the middle of Monday uh, having a nice conversation and maybe our neighbors who have to go to the job site, right? Or have to, uh, to go to HEB and work the register. Yeah, that is such a valid point, um, as were the others. Dr. Doherty, would you like to speak on this before we move on to our Q&A section? I think it was pretty well answered by the colleagues that were the panelists as far as highlighting the inherent, um, in, uh, just blanked on the word. Um, Inequality? Thank you. I would say <laughs> it just, it's been a, it's an interesting day already. Uh, highlighting the inherent inequalities in our healthcare system, in our socioeconomic system, uh, based on socioeconomic status, uh, age, race, all these things are, um, yes, everyone can potentially be infected, but uh, the rates of ne significant negative outcome are much higher in those with pre-existing conditions or um, lack of access to healthcare or lack of ability to shelter in place um, for any number of reasons. Um, um, 
yeah, the realities of this pandemic just are different for different people. And so much of that is because of the structures we put in place to, um, I guess, divide society and structure differently um, for different people. Um, and it's not fair. So I will, sorry for my editorialization, <laughs> um, but I will move on now to the Q&A portion of this panel. We actually have quite a few questions that came in. Um, so I will start with the first one. Um, this comes from Patrick Green. Um, I believe up for anyone to grab to answer. Um, so this is a question. Are we seeing this pandemic? Oh, Dr. Pearson, I think there's a little bit of a back. Okay, thank you. Um, but, but whenever you want to answer, please feel free to unmute yourself. Um, so the question is, are we seeing this pandemic bring up new leaders that are able to motivate nations to take actions for global cooperation and assistance? For example, we saw the issue with the United States competing with each other um, for medical supplies while contrasted by China currently being the largest contributor to emergency medical supplies. So the question is, are we seeing this pandemic bring up new leaders that are able to motivate nations? Um, I think we touched on this earlier, but I'd like to reiterate that point for our new viewers. Um, I forget who answered that earlier, or who touched on that earlier, but feel free to jump in. Maybe. I guess I would say the, uh, some, countries some countries are doing a good job. We're talking about France and Denmark. I really think they've done a great job. Um, economic consequences of it. I mean, Boris Johnson didn't take it very seriously. Uh, I thought he was a little serious now after catching it. Um, but I think some of the foreign, well, I don't think Trump has done a particularly good job, to put it mildly. Um, and since he dismissed the um, virus from the mission at all for an entire month, and that's valuable time. Um, so I, guess, I guess that'd be my first reaction. Yeah, I think we're having a little bit of trouble with the audio from Dr. McPherson. Um, it's a little scratchy, but I think just to summarize, I think what he said, what I was able to catch, um, Dr. McPherson was saying he has seen the rise of some uh, countries taking this on well, such as leaders from, I think you said Denmark and Sweden, or? France. 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 And he does not he think he's doing a good job. Good job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, can we another panelist? Maybe Dr. McPherson, can you mic? <laughs> I feel so bad. <laughs> it's just like the feedback. Yeah. yeah. So sorry. Okay. Another panelist? Um, again, the question is, are we seeing this pandemic bring up new leaders that are able to motivate nations? Um, if we feel like that's answered, we can move on, actually. Um, the one thing I would just say with that is when you see leaders of whatever country um, uh, is, if they are listening to scientists and the data that's being provided to them and listening to, you know, social, social distancing, listening to the virology, listening to the epidemiology, and then making policy on that. Like most scientists, we're not policymakers, but we are going to track the data and provide the best honest picture that we can based on the data that we have and advise as far as, you know, opening the economy too soon or closing things down or this, that, and the other. And then when that advice is followed, then the countries generally do a little better. So any leader, regardless of who they're, if they're listening to that advice and dictating policy based on that, I would think, that's rising to the challenge. Not so much necessarily a new leader, but leaders listening to experts in whatever field, whether it's economics or biology or whatever they happen to be dealing with. Right. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. Uh, I think that science literacy should be like a basic qualification for policymakers in the, in, under the current circumstances. I think having a basic understanding of how 
uh, not just epidemiology, but science in general and how pathogens uh, move through populations. Texas has just formed uh, a committee, a board to determine when we can quote unquote open up the economy. Most of those people are not doctors or scientists, right? The Bill Miller's guy is on the panel uh, and I'm not sure what his epidemiological qualifications are, but I think um, to Dr. Doherty's point, uh, I think it would be an essential component of any policy making at this juncture for, for leaders uh, to be um, literate in the sort of the basic science of, of uh, pathogens. Okay. Um, thank you to, the, um, to Patrick Green for that question. Um, we have a, another question from Laura on Facebook. Um, almost every medical story addresses those who have COVID-19. Um, can you address the effects of those who are unable to receive medical treatments and procedures now because of the restrictions? Can you speak about the effects for those whose health is now deteriorating or those who are unable to be screened for, can for cancer, for example? What will the consequences be? So I think the question is asking what, um, what are the effects of COVID-19 on those people who need regular medical treatments and are not able to get it maybe from the over um, crowding or over like usage of medical uh, facilities now due to COVID like ventilators and stuff like that. Can I think you know, there are very specific um, issues related to, to this particular outbreak of, of COVID-19. Uh, and we're increasingly seeing people who are requiring um, sort of uh, renal support, like dialysis machines and so on. Uh, it, that seems to be one of the sort of um, downstream effects of, of COVID infection for some uh, segment of the infected population. And so that definitely puts pressure on our ability to provide those sort of normal um, sort of resources for people who require those uh, on, a, on a weekly basis or a bi-weekly basis. Uh, so I think, you know, in terms of answering the question most directly, we had a, a health system that is already sort of not um, super resilient in terms of responding to sort of normal everyday provision of resources. Uh, and now we've um, placed on top of that a uh, kind of extraordinary set of circumstances. I mean, the way that we have organized our healthcare system uh, in this might be insufficiently responsive to the challenges of, of something like this. Right. I think something that came to mind and might relate to some of the experiences of people watching this is has everyone's been watching the Cuomo brothers, maybe like clips of them. Um, and I heard like Chris Cuomo currently has COVID-19 and he was actually talking about how he was sent um, like a bunch of oc like oxygen uh, monitors, the ones you put on your finger and which are essential to like tracking COVID-19 um, progression. So I think um, part of the issue is like you don't, a lot of people don't have access to this. A lot of people don't have rich friends to send them oxim oximeters or whatever they're called. Um, so there is this like disproportionate um, illness or disease. And uh, when you, that's exacerbated if you already have this pre-existing condition, if you already have, um, you already need to go to the hospital for cancer and things like that, your um, amount of resources are greatly reduced when other people are buying them up or stocking them or um, when, yeah. I mean, anyone want to jump on that? Sorry, that was a little bit of rambling, but. <laughs> I would think it also speaks to the idea of the new normal is the old normal was you could realistically go to an ER if you had some unexplained pain or a severe UTI or something. You could go to the ER and get treated, but there's probably a lot of people who don't feel safe doing that because they don't want to encounter COVID patients who may or may not be showing up to the ER uh, with proper protection or something like that. So, Persons may not be seeking the normal preventative care or even emergency care that they might need because they weigh this problem I have is less severe than potential potentially contracting COVID-19 for myself or for potentially exposing my family. And as was mentioned, you know, our healthcare system is very focused on dealing with the COVID-19 issue, but there are many things that are potentially being 
left behind or resources being gobbled up for this, um, maybe deservedly so, but we don't have enough for everything that we need. And so it's definitely gonna impact patients and people outside of directly via COVID-19. Um, I mean, as far as elective surgeries have predominantly been canceled. Um, so things that go to women's health, things that go to maintenance of, you know, like periodontal disease or whatever, those things have been pushed to the wayside for protection. Um, and that those things can deteriorate. One of the commenters mentioned uh, cancer. Absolutely. Early detection is key to positive outcome. Right. That actually leads in really well to um, a question from Craig Mills. Um, one of his questions, he has two for us. One of his questions actually has to deal with this um, distrust that patients or um, individuals in general who might not be patients, they might feel with returning to um, this new normal or this the normal way of life. Um, resuming more casual, intimate contact with strangers um, might um, result in distrust based on some of the mis and disinformation he says that we might receive from federal administration. Um, maybe we can connect those ideas of uh, misinformation from the federal level and distrust that people might feel individually with returning to society, um, going to the grocery store, going to restaurants maybe eventually. Um, can anyone speak on that? I guess the question here is how confident will individuals be? And I think the general consensus from the panel thus far has been not very. Um, if anyone has anything more to add to that. I think again, yeah, just to jump in and, and maybe just get the ball rolling. Uh, I think it's very, very difficult to predict uh, how people may or may not feel in six months about shaking hands at church, or, you know, whatever whatever it is that, uh, that we're, Imagining the, for the future, uh, I think again, um, individuals will adjust their behavior based on on what happens in the interim, right? If we are successful in maintaining a deep uh, and and serious social distancing, if we don't jump the gun on on opening the country up or, or Texas up uh, to you know prematurely, um, I feel like there are so many variables in, in terms of our ability to answer this. It's always the question about the future um, that it, that it's extremely difficult. I can say with certainty that active disinformation or misinformation that's coming from, um, you know, from the sort of highest offices of the land uh, in no way help. And in fact, it's hindered to an extraordinary degree uh, people's general trust uh, in, in the uh, position and, and authority of experts, for instance, uh, general trust in institutions, right? The institutions of, of medical system, the public health system, or, um, or the state, etc. Um, and so, you know, again, to return to an earlier point, uh, having people take responsibility for, um, for their public pronouncements, particularly when those people have a tremendous microphone, um, and a very, very tall platform from which to make these pronouncements uh, foremost, or should be foremost, uh, recommendation. Right. Um, Craig Mills also wants us to, is, is curious to ask the panel of who knows about um, parallels in history to what we're experiencing right now. So like pandemic we're experiencing right now, has this happened before? And how can that maybe inform um, how, you know, inform our predictions that we're making? Um, I say that like that's a joke that we're not making predictions, I guess. Um, but how can this history, how can history inform how we resume containment of such outbreaks or how we resume back to normal life? Quote unquote. The Craig Mills was kind enough to mention Spanish flu, which is often we refer to as the 1918 flu. But a respiratory illness spread across the globe, killed lots of people, very severe illness. But what's notable is 1918 might be a bit of a misnomer. It should actually be called the 1918 to 1920 flu because like Dr. Montoya referenced earlier, we see reemergences of this disease. So even if we flatten the curve and we are able to get a significant decrease in transmission, it's entirely possible that that without a safe, effective vaccine that is widespread applied or uh, available, 
you see reintroductions. And so we have to, as far as our new normal, be prepared to reinstitute social distancing things. If we open the economy, open the states back up, and we see a resurgence, we need to be able to pull back and reinstitute social distancing. And this may happen over the next you know, few years, um, probably hopefully to a lesser, significantly lesser extent, um, but that's something that people should adjust their activities as best they can to at least be prepared for. And as was mentioned by other panelists, when it comes to our um, policies and our systems, keeping in mind that this can and likely will happen again, whether it's COVID-19 or it's something, a new coronavirus or something like that in the next decade, we should learn from this and take lessons from history and see what we can do to better prepare ourselves. Great, okay, thank you. Um, our next question comes from Facebook. It's a question for Dr. McPherson. Um, what will a $2.2 trillion stimulus Sorry, Dr. McPherson, there's just a little bit of background noise. Um, we can skip this question for now if we... Um... We will miss you. <laughs> we won't answer any economic questions <laughs> until you... <laughs> Um, okay, let's move on then. Um, so we have another question. Let me see. Um, okay, this kind of has to do with uh, information and media coverage of the pandemic. So the question is, during the pandemic, there's been so much media coverage that is overwhelmingly negative about China that the American public opinions hostility towards China is at its highest level in decades. The GOP just recently decided that blaming China will be their election year strategy. Do you think this pandemic will permanently change the US-China relations to a point of no return? And how would that affect the world? Dr. Um, Dr. McPherson is muted. So maybe Dr. Zhang, do you want to jump in on this? Oh, we can't hear you. For some reason. Is it working now? Yes, yeah, there we go. So one of the most uh, heartbreaking aspect um, of this um, pandemic is that um, it is intertwined with political discourses and, and it cannot be separated from the political discourses. Um, um, my research project um, actually for the sabbatical is to look at uh, media um, and uh, internet um, event. Um, and uh, I've been watching closely uh, in both countries um, how the media um, has um, actually um, been um, somehow um, in, um, entangled uh, with political discourses, the reports about the virus itself. And um, a lot of times it's politically motivated um, and uh, I see um, how this is really creating a lot of emotions. Uh, that's actually my, um, you know, to mobilize people to actually to, to do things and to be so sure about what they already believe. And this is uh, very unfortunate. And, but I don't think the uh, media coverage itself will lead uh, the two countries to a no point of return. Um, I think there are uh, other more important factors uh, such as uh, economic interests and uh, um, you know, the US um, election uh, in this year intensifies this kind of media fight um, and both sides uh, should be blamed for this. Okay. Um, we have quite a few questions for Dr. McPherson. So this is really sad that he's not here with us. Um, let's see. Um, I think we can get this going um, from we have a question. Is it possible that we see long-term or permanent effects on wealth distribution, given that many stock markets are still rising or being padded by federal efforts, while many middle and lower class people are unemployed? Is it more likely that because of said padding, that global markets will rebound and these effects have already been mitigated? Oh, 
Hello, uh, just trying to get the volume up. I couldn't hear the questions, unfortunately. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll repeat it. Uh, is it possible that we see long-term or permanent effects on wealth distribution, given that many stock markets are still rising or being padded by federal efforts, while many middle and lower class people are unemployed? Is it more likely that because of said padding that global markets will rebound and these effects have already been mitigated? Well, I guess it's not altogether certain that the stock market is going to be uh, staying at the level it is now. It's about 15% off of the uh, all-time peak, but uh, it could easily go down. It depends upon how fast the recovery is, you know, how widespread is testing, right? And they've got a very optimistic recovery period that it's going to be a V-shaped um, recovery. In other words, we went down very fast, but it'll rebound uh, quickly. It's not all the other clear that's what's gonna happen. Uh, the federal stimulus, I think, is the right thing to do. It's, it does help the stock market, but it also helps everyone um, in the sense that the Federal Reserve did an awful job in the Great Depression. And that really helped us inform that we didn't make the same mistake in 2008, 2009. And we're operating even faster in this one than we did in 08, 09. Um, you can address the inequality issues after the econ economy's recovered. You wanna get people back to work and, and the economy uh, functioning again, and then you can address it through different government policies. Okay. Um, I think a question that's related to that is asked from Facebook as well. With this, um, trillion dollar stimulus and additional stimulus bills or potential additional st stimulus bills, um, is a depression inevitable? No, it's not inevitable. Um, I think they, they're doing a definitely a, a good job trying to address the issue by, um, by doing this big stimulus package. Uh, I think it's, it's, some of it's unfortunate as I discussed earlier about paying uh, people too high a benefit on unemployment. It'd be better not to fire people. That, that would be a better strategy. Uh, that said, pour, pouring money into the economy and increasing demand will help uh, lessen the severity. Um, I think it's a good approach and depression is def far from inevitable. Um, we're doing a lot better strategy now. Um, the reason why the Great Depression was so long was because we did a lot of bad policy we let the money supply fall by a third. We raised tariffs to 90%. Um, we raised taxes in the middle of a, a depression. I mean, there's a lot of really stupid policies in the Great Depression, and that's why it lasted so long. And we're not doing those kind of policies. We have learned from the past. I would say it, the stimulus package does help and will help prevent a Great Depression. Okay. Um... Thank you. So I think um, we also have another question um, from Patrick Green again. Um, a large portion of the Dominican Republic's GDP is made up by tourism, which has been heavily impacted by the pandemic. Should economies reliant on economic assets that are currently at risk receive some sort of assistance, or is it more beneficial for a nation to recover and experience struggle on its own. Yeah, I'm sorry, I gotta I can fix the volume, uh, unfortunately, on this. I can't quite hear what's been asked. Let me just see if I can, I'm trying a different computer that hopefully has less feedback, but the volume is very low. Um, Perhaps. I can, I can uh, just very quickly, I, I'm not an economist quite, quite obviously. Um, Patrick, thanks, thanks for your question, and, and uh, I'm sorry that I can't, uh, you know, answer it from uh, with the vision of, a, of an economist. But epidemiologically, Patrick, it doesn't make any sense to let a country struggle on its own, right? I mean, it, this is sort of a kind of thinking that assumes that a place uh, that has a, an, an outbreak of epidemic infection doesn't also pose a threat to people in countries where that outbreak is not, uh, or we're not, you know, reliant entirely on tourism, right? So I think the vision, sort of economic vision um, for the past hundred years has been sort of shaped by a kind of nationalism, but epidemiology, particularly in the contemporary, um, the vision of an epidemiologist, particularly in global health, 
cannot sort of limit itself to any one particular country, right? So the DR shares a land border with, with Haiti, for instance. So uh, letting one country struggle and, you know, letting it struggle, whatever that means, um, epidemiologically does not make a, a lot of uh, sense. Any sort of pocket uh, that, is, that is left uh, unattended uh, will pose an epidemiological problem for all other pockets, all other countries. Right, so Dr. McPherson, can you hear us now? Yes, I can. <laughs> what, um, what, uh, what does leaving a, or does leaving a country to struggle on its own fit into any of these um, e like economic plans that would prevent a depression or prevent um, destruction to a country's economy in any way? Uh, you know, so much of the world has got increased globalization in terms of markets. And so that having one country doing poorly will also affect another country, all right? I mean, about one third of our, uh, our GDP is related to international trade is either through uh, imports or exports of both goods and services. So uh, having a more coordinated response and having all countries do better will all benefit, but having nationalism and uh, trade barriers and um, that'll make everybody worse off, right? Because uh, our export to someone else's imports. Right. Well, I think um, that's a really good note to end this discussion on. We are all interconnected and this affects us in one way or another. And we have to keep, um, having these discussions to gain new insight into how we can maybe um, think about the problem, but also help other people, help our communities um, that are suffering and the people that are as well. Um, we got some feedback that this was a great panel and that we all are living with technical issues. So people are having some mercy. <laughs> <on this. laughs> um, so I'd like to thank the panelists again. Um, this was really insightful, as I said, and um, thank you for taking the time to talk with us, talk with um, the live stream and all our Zoom uh, audience members. So thank you. Um, thank you to the Center for International Engagement at Trinity University um, for organizing this, um, Elsika and Katsuo, or Dr. Nishikawa, <laughs> and um, Mr. Stakes, who has been our technical um, lead you've been helping us out so thank you all i'd like to say also thank you uh rachel for for a wonderful panel i, I you did great uh and uh, everybody stay tuned for a uh a, in um, the second week of may we'll have a storytelling uh event around COVID 19 and you will see soon some information regarding to that we'd love to hear your stories and i think it's it's a great opportunity for us to kind of start the healing process by talking about our experiences. Again, I want to echo the thanks that Rachel gave to our panelists, uh, Dr. Doherty, Dr. Montoya, Dr. Jiang, Dr. Murphy. So thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it on behalf of, of the Trinity community. We're, we're so thankful that you can make yourself available for us today. Yes, and I don't want to forget, we actually do have some time. Um...